This is the video for C 4.1 Populations and Communities, where we'll take a deeper dive into communities, and this is all standard level content. A community is all the biotic factors in an ecosystem. So it's all the populations living and interacting with each other. So in this picture, I see population of corals, I see population of this kind of fish, I see populations of this kind of fish, so on and so forth. Now I want to zoom in and talk about just one species in that community and their intraspecific relationships. So intra means within and there's two different types of intraspecies relationships. We can have competition or cooperation. So in competition, that means that they are occupying the same ecological niche. So again, we're talking about one species, okay, um, competing if they're animals, it could be for food or for territory or for mates. If it's plants, they could be competing for light or different pollinators or different soil nutrients. Some of these make some really interesting um, experiments. So you might want to think about that and be able to talk about setting up an experiment to test for that. But intraspecific competition, competition within a species, really helps lead to that natural selection because some of those individuals are going to have advantageous traits and some of them are not. So this competition is really important for that. The other type of intraspecific relationship, again, within the same species, is cooperation. And this is going to be mutually beneficial to organisms that are cooperating with each other of the same species. So it could mean they're like huddling together to stay warm. You may have seen that with like reindeer and animals like that. It could be hunting in groups like a pack of uh, hyenas, or it could be defense against predators. So we want to think about like fish schooling together. So there are lots of options here for different ways that one species might cooperate with members of the same species. And that is very different than interspecific relationships. Inter means between. So these are relationships between species that are not the same. So between populations of different species. And there are six types that we'll go through, one of which is herbivory. So this is when primary consumers like this aphid are eating primary producers like this plant. It may or may not result in that producer being killed. So it could be sheep grazing on grass or aphids or snails eating algae, but Herbivory is one type of relationship. Again, we'll talk about five more, and I want you to keep an eye out for the fact that they all are between two different species that are living in the same community. I also want you to keep an eye out for the theme running through theme C, which is um, <laughs> interdependence and interaction. So how are these different species interacting and how are they interdependent? Okay, so we have herbivory. Let's move on to number two, which is predation. And this is when one species is killing and eating another species. So this one must be about killing, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a primary producer like herbivory. So this is your classic predator-prey relationship. A hawk eating a mouse, a dolphin eating a fish, a ladybug or a ladybird, depending on where you live, eating an aphid, okay? So these are those little aphids we were just talking about a moment ago. Um, this is an example of predation between two different species. We can also have interspecific competition, so where these two different species are competing for the same resource or competing to occupy the same niche. So it could be different types of barnacles that are all fighting for the same space on a rock. Or in this case, this is ivy that's climbing up the tree, and it's doing that because the ivy and the tree are competing against each other for light or cheetahs and lions often are competing for the same prey, but again, different species that are competing for the same resource. So now it's time for some good news, right? <laughs> another way that species um, can have relationships with one another in a community is that they can have a mutualistic relationship. And mutualism is when two species are interacting and they are both benefiting from that interaction. So for example, this hummingbird is getting nectar from this flower, so it's getting food. And meanwhile, this flower is being pollinated, some of the pollen is being carried by 
by the hummingbird to potential mates um, in a different location. So mutualistic pollinators, um, algae and coral, which we'll talk about later, have a mutualistic relationship. And plants often have these mycorrhizal fungi on their roots to help increase surface area. We'll talk more about them too, but both benefiting is a great um, way to remember mutualism. Back to bad news, let's talk about parasitism. So parasitism is when a parasite is living in or on a host. Okay, so a great example here is this giant Padma plant. It's a plant, but it doesn't do a lot of photosynthesis. It's not really making its own food. Instead, it's sucking the nutrients out of the vine that it is attached to. So it is a parasite. The difference between this one and predation is that the host generally isn't killed. It wouldn't really benefit the parasite if the host it was depending on was dead. So in predator prey, the prey is going to be killed. Here in this parasitism relationship, the host is harmed, but usually not killed. So we see this again with things like tapeworms or things with ticks. Um, they are benefiting, the host is being harmed, but the host doesn't necessarily, or the host doesn't die. And the sixth type is similar, but it has some differences. It's called pathogenicity. And pathogenicity is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pathogen, a bacteria, a fungi, a protist, a virus, something living inside of a host. So obviously that's going to cause some problems for the host. It's unclear what benefit that pathogen gets, maybe none, okay? But it is a relationship between two different species. So we have to recognize that as being an interspecific relationship. So here's a picture of potato blight. Potato blight is a fungus and that is living on these potatoes. So it acts as a pathogen here and these potatoes are dying. So pathogenicity is its own type and our last type of interspecific relationships within a community. Now I want to go back to that concept of mutualism, an interspecific relationship between two different organisms, and let's talk about a few specific examples. So it's important to point out that most of our examples are going to involve um, individuals or species from different kingdoms like animals, plants, bacteria, etc., because they bring very different things to the relationship. And that's important because it's very unlikely that they would try to occupy the same niche. If they were occupying the same niche or if they were too similar, they would probably be in competition for each other. So usually between very different organisms one of which are, are these pea plants, okay? So the pea plants are all belonging to this family. And if you look at their roots, you're going to find these nodules on their roots. These are little protective nodules. And who's hiding in there? Well, the bacteria that they have a mutualistic relationship with. So these nodules on the plant are going to provide things like carbohydrates and energy and protection for the bacteria. This rhizobium bacteria, on the other hand, is going to be able to absorb and fix nitrogen and make it into an available form that that pea plant can use. Without that bacteria doing that, all of the nitrogen in the soil would be unusable for that pea plant. So this is a huge advantage for the plant and a huge advantage for the bacteria. Great example of mutualism. In keeping with this theme of plant roots, let's look at a different mutualistic um, relationship. This is between mycorrhizae, that's a fungus, and orchids, okay, which is a plant. So the orchids are going to provide carbohydrates from photosynthesis. So imagine their leaves are up here making glucose and carbohydrates and they're storing them down here in the roots. The fungus really enjoys that. It's getting some nice food from that carbohydrate source. And in turn, the fungus is able to absorb and um, supply nutrients from the soil that the plant needs. So that fungus provides a much greater surface area for absorption and really helps the plant get the most out of its soil. So something benefiting for both of them.
And we'll talk about one more example of mutualism. This is the one I always make sure I remember because it can be something to talk about in multiple different topics. Um, this is the zooxanthellae and the hard corals. So corals are an animal and they live in this like hard calcium carbonate little shell here. And they provide a protected environment um, that is close to the surface of the water that that algae can live in. Why is it important that it's close to the surface of the water? Well, because algae are photosynthetic and they need access to light and carbon dioxide. Oh, that carbon dioxide, that's going to come in handy. That's going to come right from this coral. So remember, coral is an animal. It's not doing photosynthesis. So it's going to be taking oxygen and carbohydrates and using them for cell respiration and producing carbon dioxide. So in addition to that shelter, okay, that the coral is providing, it also has access to or also produces carbon dioxide that that algae can then use for photosynthesis synthesis. Great. What is this zooxanthellae algae doing for the coral? Well, it's photosynthesizing, so that means it's making carbohydrates, and that coral is an animal. It needs to consume things. It's going to consume those carbohydrates as food. It also supplies the oxygen that the corals need for cell respiration. Ah, so oxygen and carbon dioxide um, are in an exchange here between an animal and a photosynthetic algae. And so this is a really great example, again, of things like cell respiration, photosynthesis, mutualism, interaction, interdependence. We'll get into this when we talk about climate change. Lots of things to unpack here with this mutualistic relationship. Again, mutualism is something that we generally only see when organisms are from different kingdoms, that they're really different. Similar organisms tend to be in more of a competitive situation. So we're going to classify organisms in an area in a few different ways. If they occur naturally in an area, they are said to be endemic. So for example, the Amur tiger is endemic to Siberia. Great. Alien species are species that are introduced outside of their normal range by human activity. And whether that's purposeful or by accident, it's when we're taking some kind of species and putting it somewhere where it doesn't naturally occur. If that alien species is very successful in that environment and starts to spread rapidly and increase in number, then it becomes what's called an invasive species. So alien species can become invasive species if they are successful enough. A lot of times that's because they lack some of those density dependent factors like natural predators um, or naturally occurring parasites and pests, but they become much, um, their population grows much faster than the endemic species that are controlled by that density dependent factor. Invasive species are often able to outcompete endemic species. Again, they don't have as many things that they're fighting against. Um, and endemic species that have been there for very long periods of time have really carved out and occupied a much smaller niche. They've become very much a specialist in their ecosystem. So when an invasive species arrives, okay, it can often outcompete that endemic species it can steal parts of that niche or the whole niche from the endemic species and the endemic species can go extinct. And so we see that a lot in Arctic habitats, especially um, as climates are changing and animals from more temperate zones are able to occupy those areas and outcompete Arctic animals. Another example is this. This is an invasive species. It looks real pretty, but it's not. Um, this is a red lionfish. And in some areas, red lionfish are endemic and they're no problem. But in the Caribbean, they are an invasive species and they are out competing endemic species and causing mass extinctions of many types of fish that live in that environment. Now there's actually a mathematical and experimental tool to help you determine the extent of interspecific competition. So again, this is between two different species and it's called the chi-squared test for species association. 
If you've already studied things like genetics, maybe you've used the chi-square test for other things. This is a very particular application of the same statistical test. And what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to do random quadrat sampling. So what I'm going to find is that this works very well for sessile organisms. And I'm going to take random samples with my quadrat. And I'm going to be counting how many times species A occurs by itself, how many times times species B occurs by itself and how many times species A and B occur together. All right, so that's the kind of data I want to gather. I'm going to have two hypotheses. My null hypothesis is that the two species are distributed independently and that means that A does not depend on B. My alternative hypothesis is that the two species are associated. So if I reject this null hypothesis, okay, that just means that they are associated. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are competing. I would need to do some further investigation to figure that out. Okay, and so that's the difference between experimental studies like mesocosms and field manipulation. This chi-square test for species association is more for observational studies. We're looking at patterns for where organisms already exist. So let's take a look at some observations that I made about species A and species B. What is this telling me? <laughs> Well, this is telling me that I had 45 quadrat samples where species A and B were both present. That I had three quadrats where I had species B present but species A was absent. And six quadrats where species A was present and B was absent. And 31 quadrats where both of them were absent. And so I want to know if this data indicates whether or not they're associated with one another. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find my row and column totals. So I'm going to be adding up each column and I'm going to be adding up each row and then I'm going to be finding a total and I'm going to hope that that total is the same no matter whether I'm adding the, the row or the, or the column. Ah, this should say column and row. Now, this again is what I have observed. In order to perform the chi-square test, I also need to have expected values. So I'm going to go ahead and fill in all of my rows and all of these things along the periphery with the same values that I had in my um, other data table here for my observed values. What I'm really interested in are these four rows here, or these four boxes. And the way that we're going to get these boxes is we're going to use this formula up here. So the expected box would be the row total, so that's here, times the column total, so that's here, divided by the grand total. So in my calculator, I will be putting in 48, Okay, and that's my row total, times 51, and then I'm going to divide that by the grand total of 85, and that tells me that my expected total for this box is 28.8. And I want to repeat that for all three of these boxes here. And it's a good time to check your math because when you add up um, these rows and these columns, you should be getting numbers that actually add up together. So what do we need out of all of this stuff? Well, these are my four expected values that I'm going to be using in my chi-square table. And these are my four observed values. So it's these eight values that I'm going to need for this next step. So I'm going to set up a little table here to help me calculate this value called chi-squared. And I have four conditions that I'm looking at. Times when they're both present, both absent, or when one is present and one is absent. Okay, so I'm going to fill in my values from both my observed table and my expected table. And now I can start to calculate chi-squared. So the formula for chi-squared, and I'll try to color code them here, is observed minus expected. Okay, so I'll do that in black. Observed minus expected. 
and then we're going to square that difference. So observed minus expected squared, and I'm going to divide that by the expected value. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and plug all of these into my calculator, but I'll just preview this first. So to find this, I would take 45 minus 28.8 on my calculator, and then I would square that, and then divide that by 28.8. And here's what I'm getting when I do that for all of these columns. Wow, so where is this going? The important part here is to total them all together and to get our chi-squared value. So when I add all these together, I'm getting 52.33, and that is what we call the chi-squared value. Now we need to compare that calculated chi-square value with what we call a critical value. And for that, I'm going to need a critical value table, but first I need to know what part of the table to look at. Well, in biology, we typically use a p-value of 0.05, and I need to cross-reference that with what's called degrees of freedom. So you'll notice in your chi-square critical value table that you'll have degrees of freedom listed down one side, one, two, three, four, maybe all the way up to 20, okay? And then we'll have p-values listed across the top, like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, so on and so forth. So I know for sure that I want to look at things in this column where P is 0 0.05, but how many degrees of freedom do I need to have? Well, there's a, a simple and a not so simple way of determining this. So the not as simple way of determining this is to take the number of rows minus one, so that's two, two minus one is one, times the number of columns minus one, two minus one again is one, so one times one, okay, so that's one. So that's one way to do it. The easy way to remember this is if you're comparing the association between two species, your degrees of freedom will always be one, okay? You won't have to on an exam compare more than two species. If you decide to do that for like an IA, that's up to you. But in this case, anytime we're comparing two species, our degrees of freedom is one. So what I wanna do is I wanna cross reference in my chi-square table where one degree of freedom meets 0 0.05 in this critical value table. And I'm going to notice that that's 3.84. I don't have a picture of the critical value table here, but you can find one. They'll all say the same thing. So here's the rule. If the calculated chi-squared value is greater than the critical value you found in the table, you reject the null hypothesis and you accept the alternative hypothesis that there is an association between the species. So in this case, I can confidently say I'm 95% confident that there is an association between species A and species B because the calculated value is greater than the critical value. Do I know if it's competition? I don't know. I would need to do an experimental study. Okay, so let's climb out of that math for a second and go back to some graphs and take a look at things a little bit more holistically. We'll take a look at some of these predator-prey graphs, like the one that we're seeing here with the predator and the prey, and we're gonna use these as an example of a density-dependent control, and we're especially looking at animal populations. So predators and prey tend to follow these lagging cycles with one another. So when the prey population goes up, that means that there is more food for predators, and that means that the population of predators will go up. Great for everybody, right? Well, as the population of predators grow goes up, so does predation. All of those predators need to eat. And so that means that the prey population will go down. When you have fewer prey, that means that there is less food for predators, and that means that the environment can support fewer predators. So some of those predators are going to die of starvation.
When there are fewer predators, that means that there is less predation, and that's going to cause an increase in your prey population. And then guess what? Then I'm right back to where I started in the beginning. And so that relationship explains this kind of like, you know, you almost looks like sine and cosine if you're a real nerdy. It explains these kind of lagging graphs where when the prey population goes up, okay, eventually the predator population will go up as well. So, but they should be going together. Now, what we were just looking at is an example of what we call top-down control. So we're gonna have top-down and bottom-up control, and both of those are going to affect populations. Top-down control is something like predation, where we have something from a higher level affecting the population at a lower level. So the predator population, like let's say that went up, okay, more predators means less herbivores, but that also means greater producers because there's fewer herbivores eating it. And if there's more producers though, that means there's probably less nutrients in the soil because there's more producers. This doesn't mean that everything goes down. What top down means is that there's something from the top that when it changes, it affects things at the bottom. Bottom up control is a little bit different. So let's say that there is a real like nutrient shortage, like you're in really like nitrogen poor soil or something like that. Well, if there's relatively little nutrogen, nitrogen in the soil, that means it's going to affect the producers, that there won't be very many plants. If there's not very many plants, that's going to affect the number of herbivores, not very many herbivores. And that means that there won't be very many predators. So as you can see, both of these can happen, but one will be dominant in an ecosystem depending on the resource that is most scarce. Okay, so this is an example of top down and bottom up control. And we'll end this video with one last great example of interaction and interdependence. As you've probably noticed, the populations of one species can be highly dependent on others. And we'll look at this example called allopathy and antibiotics. Now, most metabolic pathways are common to most organisms. Like we all have like, let's say, electron transport chains for cell respiration. But there are few, there are few that are very unique to a certain organism. So if um, one species can target that specific metabolic pathway that's unique to an organism, it can control that population without having to worry about harming itself or others. So great example here, antibiotics. These are secreted by things like the penicillin fungi, and we see that here. Here's some fungus, and it's growing on a plate of bacteria, but none of the bacteria are growing near the fungus because it's secreting antibiotics, things that target bacterial metabolism, like the building of a bacterial cell wall. And so this is an example of a plant. It's called the tree of heaven plant. If you want to look that up, it releases a chemical that can kill other nearby plants. Um, and so it actually outcompetes plants nearby. It's become an invasive species. It's been really good at carving out that niche. And you can actually test for this. This is really cool. So you can take some of the bark from that tree and you can grind it up and you can um, soak it in a filter paper. We can then take another filter paper that's just soaked in water. And on each of these filter papers, we can put some radish seeds. Now radish seeds, when they germinate, are going to grow out this root. It's called a radical. And measuring the length of this root is a really great way of measuring germination rates so we can see whether or not this bark that produces these allopathic chemicals works in eliminating competition from these radish seeds by measuring the germination rates in these seeds versus these. Again, a great example here about the interdependence of different species within this community.